and I also, before I get started, I wanted to say um, I'm very grateful to Tomas Storm, Nina Dmitrieva, and Andre Silber for organizing this conference and making it possible for us all to come together. I mean, this has been fantastic already, and I think, um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm also just very, very pleased to be in a session <laughs> um, with Rudolf Mehr, Angela Breitenbach, uh, David Heider, and Bennett McNulty, um, some of my favorite Kantians, and um, I'm, I'm excited to hear what people have to say. Um, one more preparatory remark before I get to my slides. Um, this is a paper that's partly growing out of two recent papers, uh, one of which um, is in print since a couple of years ago and um, called Kantian Essentialism and the Metaphysical Foundations, and another of which I just finished up. It'll come up in the paper um, for the Cambridge Critical Guide to the Metaphysical Foundations of Natural Science. I'm so proud of myself that I remembered that. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, that's edited by Bennett McNulty and will be coming out. Um, and so this is partly a sequel to that work and I'm trying to push it in various directions. And so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what, uh, what you think. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. My talk today is called Worlds and Powers. Reason in Kant's Theory of Matter in the Metaphysical Foundations. And if you'd like to discuss this talk further, um, my email address is here, and of course there'll also be questions afterward. A quick overview of the talk. Um, what I'm going to be defending today is in essence the idea that the account of the concept of matter and material substance in the metaphysical foundations of natural science is bound up with Kant's idea of the completeness of the system of nature. And I want to argue in particular that Kant's description of certain fundamental causal powers to matter as such, or matter as it appears to us, is an important component of his account of the completeness of the system of nature. I won't be able to give a full account for this claim, but I'll be able to sort of lay out some of the basic uh, components of my argument for this claim. I also want to argue for the importance of finitism in Kant's methods in the metaphysical foundations of natural science, and I'll say in section four below what I mean by that. But for now, let's get started. So first, I want to say something about the role of the concept of matter in the metaphysical foundations of natural science, and of course it's at the center. Um, matter is a liminal concept. It occupies a boundary between essentially, or what Kant calls intrinsically empirical concepts, and pure or a priori concepts. Matter does have a priori determinations with respect to space and time, for instance, but it's also a concept that we only know about, according to Kant, because of empirical observation. So I want to begin with a passage that's very fundamental to my understanding of Kant's account in the metaphysical foundations. Here, Kant argues that the doctrine of body can only become a natural science if we can apply mathematics to that doctrine. And Kant argues, and this is very, uh, very much in the, in the spirit of this conference, that in order to do so, in order to apply mathematics here, we have to give principles for construction of the concepts that belong to the possibility of matter in general. And here he says what I've already alluded to, that a complete analysis of the concept of matter in general will be the basis of his account. And this, Kant says, is a task for pure or non-empirical philosophy. But for this purpose, pure philosophy doesn't make use of any particular experiences but only what it finds in the isolated concept itself. But then Kant notes in parenthesis that this concept is intrinsically empirical. So you see what I mean by saying that the concept of matter is a liminal concept for Kant. It occupies this space in between empirical and pure. Kant argues nonetheless that the concept can be determined in relation to the pure intuitions in space and time and in accordance with laws that essentially attach to the concept of nature in general. And this is what Kant calls a genuine metaphysics of corporeal nature. Now we might wonder then, exactly how are we to approach the idea 
of analyzing the essentially empirical concept of matter from the perspective of pure philosophy. And in 1994, Peter Plas in Kant's theory of natural science took a stab at an analogy here. He says, what if we think about another concept other than the concept of matter? What if we think about electron? The concept of electron is empirical. It's, a, it's an empirical thing. But if we want to think from a pure perspective about it, we can take as a point of departure how the electron appears to us, how it manifests itself as such. Here, we're then going to want to focus on, and this is highlighted on in the text, what the criteria are for judging whether a given appearance is the appearance of an electron. Now note, this is going to become important, the relationship between a priori, we might say, rules or criteria for judging whether something falls into or out of a particular category or concept, but the fact that those criteria are criteria for whether an appearance counts as an appearance of that thing. So we're giving a priori criteria for what counts as an appearance or a phenomenon of a certain kind. And here we want to know exactly what necessarily belongs to the self-manifestation of the existence of the electron as such. And here we want to start from the nature of that thing, or what Kant elsewhere calls the real definition or essence of that thing. The nature of an electron, Plas goes on, is the first inner principle of everything that belongs to the existence of an electron. But here, remember, this nature is going to, in our account, belong to this thing insofar as it can manifest itself to us as that thing. And this, I think, is exactly the way that we should approach Kant's account in the Metaphysical Foundations. Here Kant is going to give us, in the parts of the Metaphysical Foundations, and I've argued for this before, um, he's going to give us the elements of a real definition of the concept. In other words, the criteria for deciding whether or not a given substance that appears to us is material or not, or whether something, some phenomenon is matter or not. So I won't read these out, um, but these are the Pharonomy, Dynamics, Mechanics, and Phenomenology. And you note from what is on the, from what is on the page here, from what's on the slide here, that these are definitions these are characteristics of matter. Matter is the movable. It has motive force in itself. It fills space and it can be an object of experience. These are criteria for what matter is insofar as it can appear to us as phenomenal substance. This is what Kant is telling us in the successive parts of the metaphysical foundations. Kant's account of matter involves showing that it necessarily belongs to the concept of matter, that if it's to become an object of experience, it must have certain properties. Fundamentally, it must be possible to measure how much a material substance has moved with respect to the subject and with respect to other objects. And if we're to have a concept of matter at all, we must describe to it certain forces. These include, as I'll go over in a second, impenetrability, or a power of extension, as Kant calls it, but not inertia. So Kant's second law of dynamics is that matter fills its spaces through repulsive forces of all its parts, that is, through a force of extension proper to it. So insofar as matter fills space, it does so in virtue of the fact that all of its parts are um, possess repulsive forces. And this collectively Kant calls a force of extension. Kant goes on to say in a remark on the second law that impenetrability is a fundamental property of matter. And this is the fundamental property through which it first manifests itself to our senses as something real in space. So we're thinking about the basic characteristics that make it possible for matter to appear before us as phenomenal substance, as a real thing, 
And that, Kant says, is nothing but the power of extension of matter. So if matter did not have this power of extension, it would not manifest itself to our senses. It could never be um, experienced as something real in space. Inertia, on the other hand, is not a fundamental property of matter. Um, Kant argues that to use the word inertia to describe matter means nothing other than its, lifeness, its lifelessness as matter in itself. All matter in itself is, lifeness, is lifeless, sorry, and the law of inertia says that and nothing else. So matter possesses a fundamental power of extension or of, uh, repulsive force, but not inertia because Kant's account of the, of the law of inertia, and I won't say much about this, but it's really more what Kant calls elsewhere a limiting judgment. Um, we know that inertia is, does not, um, sorry, we know that matter does not possess an intrinsic um, life force or something like that, um, and the law of inertia just simply says that. Matter that is completely isolated from all other material substances will not move. Um, this is something that Kant says repeatedly. So now we've seen a couple of brief examples of why Kant thinks that in laying out the definition of matter as such and of matter as it can appear to us, we have to ascribe it certain fundamental causal powers. And we actually have to also deny it certain fundamental causal powers. I think that we can say more, and I'm not going to be able to um, justify this entire, um, all of these statements that I make in this argument, but this would be a good place to um, call me on it in the discussion period. I can make an argument that matter can be an object of experience for us only under certain conditions. First, and I think this should be fairly uncontroversial, we have to be able to measure material substances movability with respect to the subject and other bodies. Second, material substances have to resist penetration. Kant says this straight out. Third, we have to be able to determine the difference a material body makes to other bodies' movement. In other words, the forces it exerts on other bodies. Bodies are not determined to move in isolation. This is Kant's principle of succession. Fourthly, to know a material body's real motion, requires being able to determine that body's causal interactions, including its powers to influence the motions of other bodies. A material body is real to us insofar as we can measure its powers to alter the motion or state of other bodies, which we can also call forces. For Kant, unlike for Leibniz, reality is not grounded in independently intelligible, isolated properties of monadic substances. After the physical monadology, Kant worked to build an account of the powers and essential characteristics of material bodies, appealing only to phenomenal properties. All these properties have to be related to the perceiving sub subject, and in the case of causal powers, to other bodies as well. So now that I've said something about Kant's concept of matter in the metaphysical foundations, and about the idea that we have to ascribe matter certain properties in order for it to appear to us as phenomenal substance, I want to move on to talking about the difference that this account makes to Kant's notion of the completeness of the system of nature. And I want to talk about why I want to argue that Kant follows a finitist methodology here. So finitism in particular and I can't say much here, but I'll, I'll briefly characterize it. It's a negotiation of the relationship between the understanding and reason, especially when you see this in a Kantian context. So in particular, the understanding requires us to apply categories and principles to objects of a possible experience. But reason makes a demand for infinite division and for infinite extension. As is well known, these two demands um, in the Kantian system are in tension with each other. Finitism is a way of arguing that the laws or principles that you're going to apply can apply to any possible substance that can come before you as a phenomenon or any possible appearance. 
So the argument is not that you have to be able to prove that some law is valid of an actually infinite division or an actually infinite extension. It's instead to argue that if something can come before you as a phenomenon, that it will fall validly under this law. My argument is going to be, just to give away the punchline a bit, um, that insofar as material substances can come before us, can appear as phenomenal substances, Kant wants to argue they are subject to the laws of nature and to the principles of construction of material substances. I want to argue that this is a kind of finitist reasoning because the argument will be that matter in and of itself must be characterized as a phenomenal substance, as something that appears to us as part of what it is, the, the essence or nature of that thing. And that therefore, um, if it's true that material substances are phenomenal substances, then the laws and principles that we want to apply to them must hold because those laws are valid of all substances that are phenomenal, right, that can appear to us. Now, this isn't the only account that's available. One way to analyze how Kant moves from the first critique to the metaphysical foundations is to say that he shows how matter, as an empirical concept, can be determined a priori with respect to the categories as pure concepts of the understanding. And in particular, how the properties and behavior of matter can be derived from even more general a priori laws of nature. So in this case, the metaphysical foundations is about application or derivation of general a priori principles, laws, or categories to a particular empirical concept and its determinations. This is known as the derivation account, and it's mostly associated with Michael Friedman. So Angela Breitenbach in 2018 glosses the derivation account in this way. Um, for genuine knowledge of particular laws, like the laws of matter, we have to derive these from the a priori laws of nature together with the relevant empirical content. So the idea is that the basis of this derivation is the validity of the a priori general laws of nature, and we're just applying them to a particular case. Another alternative account that's available is to argue for what's a more bottom-up account here, which is that Kant is building from an exposition of the essential characteristics of matter, which necessitate conclusions about the causal powers and, necess and necessary properties of material substances. So the idea here is that instead of starting from uh, valid general a priori laws, we start from the essential characteristics of matter and derive um, more general claims or more general conclusions about causal powers and necessary properties. This is the necessitation account that's been defended um, by Watkins, Krinus, Massimi, uh, Massimi, sorry, and Messina. Um, the key proposal, and here again, this is Breitenbach's uh, gloss on this, is that empirical laws are necessary governing principles, but they obtain by virtue of the particular natures of things. So we need to know, for instance, the nature of material substances in order to know which laws apply to it. A third account that I want to defend and that I've very recently proposed is the finitist account. The argument here is that modal judgments about possible proofs that we can make or interactions that we can be explained concerning matter are first of all based on intuitive reasoning in the concrete and are motivated by the desire to avoid appeal to the infinite. They're grounded in finite decision procedures, and they're based on systems of axioms or rules of inference. And I want to argue that Kant's finitist reasoning is applied to his theory of matter as it is presented in the metaphysical foundations. The necessitation account is a plausible account, but it accounts for what are really the what you might call the constructive elements of Kant's view of matter. So in my view, Kant does indeed give an, an account, and I've said so since the beginning of the talk, give an account of the real definition or essence of matter um, in the metaphysical foundations, and that's quite um, consistent with the necessitation account. But this is really what I would call the constructive part of the view. Um, one question that we might have is why should it be the case 
that if we simply start with an account of the nature of material substances, that we should be able to show that these material substances fit into a complete picture of the system of nature for Kant. Why should it be the case that if we're simply adumbrating the necessary um, natures of material substances, that we can also show that the picture of nature as a sort of interaction of all of those substances um, should necessarily be complete? There's, there's in some ways no reason why we should be able to say that. Now, recently, Huaping Lu Adler has argued that proofs of logical completeness for Kant require a priori reflection on our concepts and principles. Completeness of the system of nature, I will argue, and I, I think others have argued as well, involves showing that any material substance that appears to us can be determined with respect to a priori concepts, principles, and laws. But the system of nature in particular can't be complete if reason makes a demand for infinite divisibility, but matter as phenomenal substance isn't divisible to infinity. And in fact, Kant argues that we can put limits on the divisibility of material substance by appealing to the essential characteristics of matter as phenomenon. Kant argues, in, and this is a quote from the Metaphysical Foundations, it doesn't necessarily follow that matter is physically divisible to infinity even if it is mathematically. Because if every part of space is a space in turn, it contains parts external to one another. So you can always mathematically divide a space into two spaces. But you cannot prove if you start with a substance and you divide it into successively into more and more and more parts you cannot prove that each of the divisions that you introduce is a division between two substances because it is essential to substances that they be movable in themselves. And so if you introduce a mathematical division between two parts of a substance, you can show that you have divided two parts mathematically from each other, but you have not proven that each of those parts is itself a substance because to do that, you would have to be able to show that each of those parts possesses the, uh, the, the, fits the criteria for being a material substance. But those criteria involve being independently movable. Simply by introducing a mathematical division, you haven't proven that. And so you can't show that mathematical divisibility of a substance implies its physical divisibility. Not every demand that reason can make will be applicable to material substances. So reason, for instance, can make a demand for infinite divisibility. But it's not necessarily true that reason that we can show that that demand for, math for mathematical divisibility will result in physical division. In some cases, in particular, those demands can't be proved. They can be made. Sorry, this is actually wrong on the slide. They can't be proved to be true of substances with the essential properties of matter. So you can't show that a mathematical division is a real division into two different substances. You can't prove that it isn't, but you can't prove that it is either a priori. So there are limits to our, our a priori reasoning about the concept of matter. So we can show that the laws of nature apply to all perceivable material substances but we can't show that they apply absolutely to any possible substance that we can, for instance, construct mathematically. So this is true of infinite division. It's also true of infinite extension, as Kant argues in the antinomies. Importantly, some but not all of the essential properties of matter and material substance are empirical. So it's not just a case where we derive laws a priori, laws of, of uh, general physical laws or general laws of, of nature a priori, and then we apply them to our empirical intuitions of matter. Instead, it's the case that we want to argue that the demands of reason can be met insofar as matter appears to us as a phenomenal substance. We know that that will be true, but we cannot show that it's going to be that those demands will be met absolutely or in any possible constructible case. That's the sense in which Kant's reasoning here is finitist. So what can we conclude? The causal powers of material substances belong to them essentially as what they are. In some cases, this is because they're only intelligible if they possess causal powers. 
And in some cases, it's because only if material substances possess certain powers will they appear to us as what they are. The world as a system of nature is intelligible to us only because it consists of phenomenal substances that can be determined with respect to a priori concepts and principles. But those substances can appear to us only because they possess essential properties, including possession of causal powers that ground interactions with other substances. Leibniz's substances contain the principles of their interactions with other substances intrinsically. Kant's substances are what Daniel Warren calls comparatively inner properties, essential properties that govern interactions with other substances and aren't absolutely independent or intrinsic. We can know material substances insofar as they appear to us and can be measured. That's true for two reasons. First, they meet the conditions for existence as phenomenal substances, and secondly, they can be synthesized as part of the system of nature in virtue of their natures or real definitions. On a finitist account, the essential properties of substances work with the laws to build the system of nature.